Well, thank you for uh, sticking it out till the bitter end of AppSec USA. Uh, I've been coming to these for about four years now, and uh, I feel kind of at home uh, with OWASP and uh, really honored to be, be speaking at uh, AppSec USA this year. I just did this talk, a rendition of this talk last week at uh, B-Sides Denver and changed a lot of things up after talking to a few people. So I went in a hole and, and added some content. Hopefully you find it useful. This isn't a big crowd, so raise your hand. If you have a question, feel free to interrupt. It's pretty casual. Um, so we're going to talk about containerizing your security operations center. Uh, it's really a talk about Docker and Kubernetes and culture and DevSecOps and all the, all the buzzword bingo words that you can uh, imagine. So a little bit about me uh, before we dive in. I'm a uh, founder of the OWASP Santa Barbara chapter, so pretty small, sleepy beach town in uh, central California. So been doing that for about five years. And uh, I'm also the organizer, one of the organizers of many for AppSec California. So definitely check it out. If you haven't been and you're from the East Coast like I am, it's really great because it's in January. I work at a software company called Invoca. Um, we do call marketing intelligence, and we have a lot of uh, big enterprise customers, so they needed some uh, security help there. So I'm working on the AppSec side of the house. And uh, I did web app pen testing for quite some time. Uh, now I'm kind of flip-flop between offense and defense. And I really like containers, so hence the talk. Uh, quick plug, at AppSec California, check it out. Uh, it's in Santa Monica on the beach. The venue, like all the talks could be horrible and it would still be an awesome conference because the venue is literally like, that's the view on the right from there. And you get to hang out with that crew, uh, that Montley crew on the left. Uh, and because winter on the East Coast, it's no fun. So uh, back to regularly scheduled programming. Um, so I had a different beginning to this talk uh, last week, but after, uh, you know, Coming to this conference, at the end of every conference, I feel like I always have these security confessions I need to make. Uh, this is a, this is from Jim Manico, basically. This is one of his favorite lines, if you've ever attended this training. It's, it's, this is a time for healing, where we, uh, we actually confess things in, in the security space that, uh, that we should just talk about in, in private. So um, what are your employees saying about your security program? Think about it. I think that um, if you put this blank there, then you never know. So is it security as a service? Maybe. That's what you think about yourself and your program. Is it security as a magic unicorn? Uh, probably not, but you could think that if you want. Uh, what they might be saying is security is a bottleneck. Security as a black hole. Things just never exit when they enter the security team. Uh, security as a no machine. Uh, this is kind of classic security, saying no to everything. Uh, security as a hot potato. I think Maybe I coined this term, I'm not sure, but I feel like this sometimes where it's only the person's problem, whoever it lands on their desk at that given time, and then everyone else is just free and clear of it. Uh, it's not my problem, it's yours. And uh, security as a PDF generator. So this is uh, this one really hurts me the most. And uh, it's 2016, and we're still literally generating PDFs for people, tossing them over the fence and saying, fix things. Uh, we, we really... We talk about DevSecOps and really integrating with our ops teams and our, and our development teams, but uh, it's hard work. So it's true. We're all understaffed. I've talked to a bunch of people the past few days. Uh, everyone wants another employee in security. Hard to find, hard to pay for, um, and we're over budget. I don't even really have a budget, but I know I'm over it uh, just by existing. <laughs> and uh, we're all too busy. So. Can we actually DevSecOps our way out of these problems? Maybe. I have a few tools and a few recommendations that can put some more power into your hands as a security practitioner um, to hopefully get us to a better place. So I'm going to start with a, a quick story. Um, this is LeVar Burton. I'm going to leave him up here for a second, laying in a pile of books. Uh, so I'm on a small team. It's just me right now. Uh, I have some liaisons around. We'll talk about that later. Um, and I always look for, you know, this one person I like to call the Securious Dev, who, in my case, watched Mr. Robot, great show, came up to me the next day. Uh, they wanted to learn all the things about hacking, and they wanted to play with the tools and, and use them and, and 
really learn. So this is like a really golden opportunity for me to bring this person on as my liaison and my helper and my second set of eyes uh, over on the dev side of the house. So I tell the developer, go download Metasploit like any good security engineer would. Go grab Metasploit um, and see what you can do. Start hacking on things. So this is where the challenge comes in. This is a new, a new developer uh, just out of college. So that night, Google's how do I download Metasploit, what is it? Uh, goes to, you can't see it there, but this is evilsocket.net, which I think is an awesome domain. Uh, goes there, and he's on a Mac, obviously, so he's gonna download Metasploit. Uh, let's just start real quick. We'll go through the step-by-step -step playbook on how to get Metasploit installed on your local machine. So put yourself in the shoes of a developer who doesn't deal with this stuff at all. So uh, number one, Xcode, easy. Uh, we go to the terminal, install it. Number two, uh, we're going to check out our Java version. Obviously, everybody's Java version is completely out of whack, so he had to reinstall it um, and update Java. 20 minutes later, we're installing Homebrew, but he uses Mac ports. And, uh, and then he's on ZSH, so it's saying go change something in your batch profile. Keep in mind, this guy doesn't really know much about you know, the operating system itself. And then install dependencies. So you need a full-blown Postgres database to run Metasploit. Um, that kind of sucks. So he, he gets it, he installs it, fires it up, didn't initialize. So our developers like to play World of Warcraft. This guy goes back to that. You basically just ruined your golden ticket to bringing a Securious dev onto your team because of awful Metasploit installation steps. Uh, that's a huge bummer. So. How do we actually make this tooling a little more accessible for people and make it less about installing the tool, maintaining it, and updating it, and all these things, and just using it for what it's intended to use? In other words, uh, how do we reach the DevSecOps castle that everybody at these conferences loves to talk about? Um, it is a magical place. Uh, I have not quite reached it, but I'm definitely making strides. Uh, one way to do it, and the way we're going to talk about today, uh, is Docker. So, Docker's been in the news quite a bit lately. Uh, it won't save the world, contrary to popular belief, but it does really make it easier to do things on a laptop and a cloud server, and in this case, our Securious dev. Uh, it's much easier for him to just get a tool running. So, brief introduction to Docker. How many of you use Docker in production? Nice. Okay, yeah, I was at B-Sides last week and I had one out of like 50. So it's a different crowd. So that's great. Um, Docker's great to run applications on, obviously, in production. We're going to be talking a bit more about your internal tooling. So well, I'll go over this quickly. So Docker is just an open source engine to pack and ship up um, con uh, containers which contain applications. It's lightweight, easy to use. And uh, people always ask, why don't you just use a VM or a virtual box? Well, we're not in 2005. Uh, traditional virtual machines have a full operating system um, included in each of them. So these are drivers and binaries and libraries. They can be massive, like over a gig. They're really hard to manage state, and they're a little clunky in my opinion. So there are some diehard like Kali Linux VirtualBox people, and I was one of those until I found containers, uh, which dramatically reduced the size of these operating systems. So it's a shared kernel infrastructure, and each container runs as an isolated process. So Things spin up fast, things spin down fast, and you can pull in images very quickly. It's not nearly as, as bloated. Uh, but it's not magic. A lot of these things and these concepts in Docker have been around for a long time. Uh, a lot of people like to think Docker is this magical thing. It's uh, basically namespaces, C groups, or control groups, and things like that uh, based off of, of traditional Docker or Linux controls. It, all it does is provide a user-friendly API to spin up, spin down images and containers. So images use layers as speed and efficiency, and we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, and the nice part for, for my use case as a security engineer, I can build this once, ship it all over. So I can run it on my local machine, I can run it on a bare metal server, I can run it on an Arduino probably. As long as Docker's on there, it'll run and it'll be consistent. Uh, so Batteries are included when you ship up a container. Uh, everything is included, all the dependencies. As long as you wrote your app right to run on Docker, it should just run, uh, uh, given you have Docker installed. 
So what about a, a developer who really just wanted to run Metasploit and do a tutorial? It's very easy now. He clicks a button on the Docker site and does a Docker run command. Um, it can't get much easier than that. So now he's actually running Metasploit, can go use some online tutorials. This works really well in like a training scenario when you're at a conference and you need people to just spin up a tool pretty quickly. So briefly we'll look at the Docker file, just to show that it's not magic. Um, each line here really creates a layer for the most part. So in from at the top, these are, uh, you're importing another Docker image. This one's called Linux Consult slash Kali. So this is from Docker Hub. Uh, many of you know this already. So as you go down, you have your maintainer and environment, and you're adding a file called init.sh, bringing it over into the container you're building. And you're running a couple simple commands, app get update, install, and then you actually run the init.sh uh, bash script, which is right here. And if you've used Metasploit, this is like, you know, level one MSF update, MSF console, gets everything running. So what could go wrong with just blindly pulling images onto your local machine? Sounds bad to me. It sounds like we're going back in time, actually. Um, there's been some recent news, uh, this is, I think, like a year ago, like 30% of official Docker images from the Docker Hub have what is it, high priority security vulnerabilities. So people are building even official images out there on operating systems that have known vulnerabilities. So I'd recommend you always inspect your Docker file, and if you're doing this in a production sense, you should probably have a hand in writing it yourself. Uh, there's some really interesting tools in the space that are coming out. Uh, Claire Key, I think is how you pronounce it, and Encore. Encore is a local Santa Barbara company. They're uh, pretty awesome. and uh, I, I stole this screenshot from them. So this is the official Nginx uh, image from Docker Hub, and there's, you can't see it there, but I think there's eight high vulnerabilities just chilling on Nginx. It's pretty awesome. So this uh, Encore.io will tell you uh, from Docker Hub publicly, they do basically CVE scans on um, and, and de deconstruct Docker images to scan them. So it's a very useful tool if you're gonna pull something from the Docker um, repo. So security is definitely catching on to this. Like Zap has a Docker file. I have some Docker files out there. Uh, Cuckoo, which is a malware analysis tool, and OSSEC Elk from the Wazoo community. This is like this crazy um, Elasticsearch and OSSEC implementation in a Docker container. Definitely check that out. We're running that in production. It's pretty awesome. Uh, so Docker Run, yeah, it's Fine, it's useful on your local machine, but it's still kind of a toy app. You can't deploy it out there and really get to the DevSecOps part of this uh, for others to use. So this is where uh, Kubernetes comes into play. And I'll do one more poll of the audience. Who has used Kubernetes in here? Me? Hmm? Who's heard of it? Anybody? Has anybody not heard of it? Cool, okay. So Kubernetes is, uh, is came from Borg, which is Google's container orchestration infrastructure they've been using for 10 years. Uh, they know a thing or two about containers, and this is the open source, uh, freely available version of that. I'm sure it's much different. And uh, this talk will go into Kubernetes in great detail, so if you have questions along the way, just feel free to interrupt. Um, I had a little help from a, a Google Cloud Security architect uh, help me build these slides out, so hopefully they're as accurate as possible. Um, so we're gonna talk about a gentle introduction. So this is a shipping ship, shipping, shipping ships, which is a pretty good analogy for Kubernetes. Uh, basically, you have this huge thing, this huge ship that was just taking containers, orchestrating them, scheduling them, figuring out what to do, um, and basically hauling your, uh, your infrastructure into production. And Kubernetes is it's just an open source platform, so it's built for deployment and scaling and the orchestration of containers. So you have a Docker container, you need to get it out onto a server somewhere, a virtual machine somewhere, to actually run so people can use it. Uh, and you can't always just like SSH to a box and do Docker run or Docker compose. So Kubernetes helps out a lot with that. Uh, it's pretty portable, you can run it um, on Google's cloud infrastructure, which I'm sure they would love for you to do. You can run it on AWS, it's where we're running it in production. You could run it on bare metal even. Uh, and they just came out pretty recently with Minikube, which is, uh, it runs on your local machine. That's like the hello world of Kubernetes. It's pretty useful. 
everything's API driven in Kubernetes, so you can make it fit whatever your pipeline is. Um, there is really just one API you have to deal with, and you can script around it for days. Uh, we have a ton of customization in our Kubernetes cluster, and I think everybody does. So it's pretty useful in that respect. And it's scalable, so you can go from one, one container up, you know, the sky's the limit. So, and it'll handle all that, that scaling up, auto scaling up and down of nodes and containers. So there are others. Uh, Kubernetes is what I'm most familiar with. I can't really speak to the others in great detail. Uh, Docker Swarm and uh, Mesos Marathon and ECS as Amazon's. I've heard a lot of people that are using Amazon's container service here. I'm sure they're all great. Uh, I just don't know them in depth. And Google built Kubernetes, so I, they know a thing or two about what they're doing. So this is a disclaimer. I had somebody give me some feedback before. They're like, Basically, um, you don't want to be this hipster and just spin and spin up Kubernetes because people are spinning up Kubernetes for no reason. Uh, it, if your company is invested in containers and container orchestration, sure, it's a, it's a really great option. But I don't recommend you just throw it out there because everyone else is doing it because it's kind of heavyweight and it will take a little bit of time to learn. Um, Docker Compose works really well for, for apps that don't really have to scale or have any kind of uh, any load balancing and things like that. So get your Docker situation figured out first and then, then move on to containers. All right, so this is the fun part. So we're gonna talk about core concepts of Kubernetes uh, from the ground up. So this is the Manitou incline. I'm from, or I lived in Colorado Springs for a while at the base of this. It's a basically a trail that in less than one mile goes 2,000 feet up. Uh, and this is what I think learning Kubernetes was to me. Uh, at first, it was a little bit overwhelming, but um, if you just grasp the core concepts and you enjoy YAML, then you'll be good to go. Uh, so basic concept number one, Kubernetes cluster. So Kubernetes uh, relies on clusters. This is, this is at its core. These are just virtual machines that are managed by Kubernetes. They're, there's a master. And then there's nodes. So in this setup here, you have one master, three nodes. This is like the standard, I want to spin up a cluster. This is kind of how it works. Uh, you can scale this out in a high availability situation where you have three masters and 21 nodes, whatever. The sky's the limit. Um, and these things all work together as one giant cluster. So you can stop thinking about virtual machines as their own entity. You don't have to manage them individually. Just think about how much CPU and RAM that you have in your cluster. Uh, next is a pod. These are groups of containers uh, that all share um, networking and storage. So a pod is the smallest deployable unit in a Kubernetes cluster. So you can have a pod that has one container running in it, or you can have a pod that has five containers running in it. This is what gets scheduled and put onto a node. So you can see here, this is a three container uh, pod that has a shared network interface and shared storage. Pretty simple. Um, but you do have to re-architect your kind of way of thinking. It's a little bit like Docker Compose in a sense, but uh, these are self-contained units that all talk to each other. So like I said about YAML uh, before a little bit, so uh, Kubernetes just relies on you writing YAML files or JSON. I choose YAML, but um, that's kind of how you can think about being an admin of a Kubernetes cluster. So here is a pod YAML spec. It's super simple. There's two containers in this pod. There's an OWASP app that pulls an image called OWASP app from the Docker, a public Docker repo, and then Nginx SSL. That's it. These things will scale together, live in the same pod, have the same network interface. And we're going to open up port 80 and 443. So all you do, write your YAML, and you upload it to your master. And there's some commands that obviously help you, help you do that. And your master will then pick a random node uh, based off of whatever resources are available, and put your OWASP app on one node. Super exciting, I know. Um, but that doesn't really scale. So it, pods are supposed to live and die. They're just these transient things that move from node to node, and they have no state. And you sh they're kind of like the cattle um, of the Kubernetes cluster. So you need to make sure you have any n number of these running at any given time. And that's where deployments come in. And 
just you can kind of throw away the pod.yaml. You won't use that in any real capacity when you're actually writing configs. You're going to be, you'd be writing a deploy.yaml file. Uh, in here, I'll highlight a couple important pieces. Uh, the bottom looks very familiar to our pod.yaml. You have OWASP app, Nginx SSL, and our, and our port mappings. Uh, but then we start to see a few things that are, are different. So labels, uh, Kubernetes relies on labels quite a bit. Uh, and labels are just arbitrary key value pairs. So here you have role web. You could call it tier front end. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. And uh, this will actually be what you identify this deployment as. So replicas four. So you saw before there was only one pod running and it's not that useful. So here we have four replicas. So we're going to always have four pods running at any given time. So again, toss that YAML over to the master. Master decides what to do. We put four pods running with our OWASP app. Um, they each get their own internal to Kubernetes, the Kubernetes cluster IP address. Awesome. So we're scaling out. You know, we're we're uh, we're growing. But we need a way for these pods to talk to each other. We need a source of truth. Uh, so in comes a service, another really important piece of Kubernetes. Uh, this is an abstraction layer. It's not a pod or a container. This is something that Kubernetes uses to enable pod communication. Uh, so a service is just that. It just gives you an IP address, a way to address any number of, of given pods. So these four pods, these OWASP apps, now can be addressed with one IP address. So these, we'll call those reporting apps up on the other side, can now talk to, to um, the OWASP app with no problem. Uh, and it handles all of our load balancing for us. So here's another service, but now we're going to toss a load balancer on top of it. So this actually opens up that reporting app up top. This will open it up to the world with a public IP address. So that's really useful, and you can do that all through a YAML file, which I think is pretty awesome because that stuff was a little hard to manage before. Uh, only some cloud providers offer the ability to, to d define a load balancer type, but most of them are all catching on. So Again, just YAML, and here we have a selector in our service YAML definition that says, hey, anything with a role.web, I want to be behind this service, and that's our OWASP app, and it's a type load balancer, so we're actually going to give it that external IP address, and these are ports that we are mapping to the outside world, so port 80, and then port 80 to the container, super simple. So namespaces, another uh, really useful part of a Kubernetes deployment when you're when you're deploying security tools. These are different. These are ways to manage different um, environments within the same Kubernetes cluster. So namespace is probably the most simple uh, YAML file, and this is makes one called Sec Tools. So what we do is we have one big Kubernetes cluster with 25, 30 nodes in it, and I have my own little safe security tools namespace that I'm allowed to touch and break and mess with things, and it works really well. Uh, it's pretty isolated. So putting it all together, uh, you have uh, you know, your, your DevOps uh, up, in the, up in the corner there. They're running kubectl, which is the command line interface for Kubernetes, and that runs over HTTPS, hits the API server, which is on your Kubernetes master, and then there's a few other things, the scheduler and uh, replication controller. That all sits on the master. That's kind of overseeing everything in the node space. So then you have n number of nodes below. Uh, this is a two node cluster. So Kubelet kind of handles the scheduling of pods as, as it gets the instructions from the API server. And then the pod is, is born. And it'll go grab um, an image from any, any repo that you want it to. And then you have, uh, if you have an external load balancer, then you have a really happy woman on her laptop just you know cruising around the internet. So this sounds really good. Uh, but what is it secure? I don't know. I didn't think it was at first. Um, then I dug in, and it turns out Google thought of a few things. So we'll go over those. Uh, keep in mind that this is totally up to you when you deploy this, how you deploy it. You can screw this up pretty bad, and I've seen that happen too. Um, so this is the Kubernetes security model. So anytime you issue a kubectl command, we're talking about authentication, authorization, and what they call admission control. Uh, they provide lots of options here, and I'll revisit this in a minute. So number one, the easiest one to knock out is transport security. So the, the kubectl API typically uses HTTPS by default. It uses, it's a self-signed cert on your local machine. This is kind of a no-brainer. I don't worry about 
the transmission layer of, uh, of the kubectl command. There's uh, many other things to worry about. So let's move on to authentication. Uh, Kubernetes supports, as of 1.3, uh, <laughs> some of these uh, uh, authentication modules. So we have basic auth, which is still bad. Uh, we have OpenID, which is really interesting. Uh, for, you use it from the command line using kubectl. I haven't played with it personally yet, but uh, it seems very promising. Uh, tokens, client cert, and what they call key store. So, or keystone, sorry. Uh, you choose uh, your own battle there, however you want your users to authenticate. And you can specify multiple, kind of like SSH, where it'll go down a list and just keep trying each of them. So on to authorization. So every HTTP request has to be authorized. It's just an, it's just the REST API. So in, Kube, in kubectl, you have uh, different actions, get, list, create, delete, uh, a few others there. But yes, so they all have to be authorized for who you are and who you, uh, after you've authenticated. So this is checked against a policy. And in Kubernetes, there are a number of different policies. I'm only going to pull out the ones that probably need to know about. There's a couple other ones. There's um, an allow all, or always allow policy. This is like when you're playing around with Kubernetes and you just want to spin it up and not like have to deal with security right away. Maybe you're in an isolated environment. This allows all, all kubectl commands through. Uh, the attribute-based access control, this is a very simple file that you give it attributes and say you're allowed to do this and not allowed to do this. Uh, as of uh, 1.2 or 1.3, and they update very often, um, we're, we're moving towards uh, role-based access control. So this is like where we want to be in the Kubernetes cluster, in, in the world of Kubernetes, where you have roles and they're defined by a, an administrator. So these are some different types of roles. I won't go into detail uh, due to time, and their docs are way better than me trying to explain all the different roles that exist. So this is just an example. Uh, again, these are uh, administered using YAML. So this will allow user Jimmy, uh, it's the pod reader role. So I'm allowed to read pods in the sec tools namespace. That's pretty great. It's granular. Um, you do have to manage this and it can get a little out of control, but um, this is a really good you know, gate as you're using kubectl. On to admission controllers. Uh, this is still kind of like magic to me uh, in Kubernetes. So the request still hasn't been granted yet. It goes through this final, final check uh, where you're running um, these admission controller modules. And any incoming request could be modified in this state. So there's some pretty cool things you can do here, like always pull images. So if you create a pod and you say, you call it Nginx, it's always going to go out to Docker Hub or whatever your, your um, container repository is to pull it. That's because you, if you knew in a shared tenant environment, if you knew of another pod that was private and you knew its name, you could pull that because it'll pull from the local node first. So this actually forces a pull from the actual source of truth. It's pretty interesting. Um, deny escalating exec. This is for privileged containers that you're rolling out in your Kubernetes cluster. This will actually say you can't use kubectl and it, you can't exec to this type of, of container. And resource quota. So this is the one I'm pretty familiar with where you're saying you only get one unit of CPU or you only get X amount of RAM um, as, as a pod or a container. So there's secrets as well. I'm going to breeze through this because everybody has their own opinion on secrets, but there's the Kubernetes way, and they have a secret um, Kubernetes secret object. They're coming out with some really good controls around this object. Uh, I think it started a little choppy. It feels kind of weird because you're just base64 encoding a string and like pushing it up to your Kubernetes cluster, um, and there weren't as many role-based base access controls before, but it's getting better. Uh, so secrets can only be accessed by pods in the same namespace. So that's a good control. If I have a production namespace versus a non-production namespace, secrets aren't shared. Uh, secrets are sent to nodes uh, when pods require it. This is a very new feature. I don't know which version. I can't quote all the versions, but that's a, that's a, that's a good thing. And it's also not written to disk. So when your auditors ask, are you storing secrets on disk, you can say no. And uh, they're now deleted once the pod is removed. So that's pretty sweet. If you don't need the, If nothing on the node needs it, get rid of the secret. Uh, but, buyer beware, there are lots of poorly managed Kubernetes clusters out there uh, that just are 
kubectl, whatever, you can do whatever you want. Um, etcd, you need to protect it because you can literally read all the secrets in a cluster as long as it's plain text and etcd. So if you're on master, you're in big trouble. Um, and don't forget what, what OWASP has taught us to, to not you know, do bad things with our code and write secrets out to logs and hard code secrets places. So Kubernetes is not gonna help you if you have bad security practices. Uh, and anyone with root on any node, and I think this may have changed the past like month, but you could impersonate the kubelet, which sits on each node, and read secrets. So if you had access to the node via SSH, you dock your exec into the kubelet, you can read secrets. So yeah, be careful with that. <laughs> uh, talk to some people about Vault. Uh, I'm pretty sold on Vault. Getting it integrated with Kubernetes, uh, that's your own journey. I, I know it's coming in like a very, a, a much more, these guys are super excited about Vault, I see. Yeah, uh, it's good stuff. I mean, API driven secrets, it's got all the right things in place. Um, but do what you will. I don't have any expert recommendations right now in Kubernetes other than uh, this somewhat haggard thing I found on GitHub. Uh, it's okay. So, like, you don't have to, at least you don't have to store your secrets on your laptop. You can grab them from Vault as a variable, toss them up as you create um, the secret. It's not a horrible way to do things. And you could automate this too on, on a different box. This was through, this was digging through GitHub comments uh, for a, quite some time. Some guys are like, just do this. So it works. Uh, this is the secret.yaml file. And ultra simple type as a secret and, or type opaque. Uh, and these are our secrets. These are base64 encoded. Nothing special, there's no encryption here. You can decode these with one line of Ruby, it's not a big deal. Um, and the best way I think to access these would be to just plug them right into an environment variable in your deployment. So you can see this, this M right here, uh, name OWASP pass, so I'll make an environment variable called OWASP pass, and then grab that secret key, plug it in, you should be good to go. This works pretty well. Like you can, you can, if you have your role-based access control down and uh, some of the other authors or authentication pieces in, you can use secrets in this way. So quickly to talk about some other security hygiene in Kubernetes. Uh, you want to be very careful with SSH to your nodes. You don't want like full reign of everybody just SSHing to your nodes because it's just Docker. They can go in and look at anything that's going on in there, um, even in especially the multi-tenant, multi-namespace environment. And only use trusted images. You know, I'm sure people have been preaching that for a bit now, but yeah, just don't pull blindly. And uh, apply updates to your Kubernetes cluster. They make it easy. There's just a drain you can use that'll just pull off all the running pods. You update. Uh, 1.4 is is the most recent, latest, and greatest. It's pretty awesome. Um, and then you can just you know, bring your node back up. Uh, log all of the things, that's kind of standard here, but make sure you're logging everything uh, that you would be in your regular app, plus all of your Kubernetes stuff. So there's a lot of logs that Kubernetes itself will generate. You wanna know who's doing what in your cluster. And there's some security contact contexts you can apply to uh, deployments as well, if the container will allow it. Uh, run is on root and read-only file systems and things like that. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over, it's not a live demo, I took screenshots uh, just because, but this is, this is all done on a two node cluster in GCE uh, running the latest Kubernetes 1.4, which the upgrade path was not as straightforward as I was hoping on GCE, but it worked, we're here. Um, this is CloudSock. This is where I just store all my security related Kubernetes configs and you can see here, it's kubebot, which is a little Slack command line tool where you can interact with uh, your Kubernetes cluster in a read-only way. Metasploit, uh, Armitage, uh, Scumbler, ThreadFix, WebGoat, ZapUI. Uh, we have OSSEC in production. I didn't make it generic enough yet to, to put it in the open source repo. Uh, but yeah, we'll just dive in. So this is, since we're at the OWASP conference, so take WebGoat, for example. Uh, this is a WebGoat deployment. Um, WebGoat, for those of you that don't know, is an intentionally vulnerable web application that OWASP has had forever. 
Um, and it's pretty awesome. I, it's a great training tool. We use it at our company to teach developers about all the things. So I wanted to put that in Kubernetes so it's running, has a domain name. I can scale it up if 50 developers want to hack on it, scale it back down if not. Uh, so this is the deployment uh, .yaml. It's very simple. Uh, we have one, one replica running. Uh, we're calling it app webgoat with tier front end. So you can have two, two labels there. And we're going to pull that Docker image from the public Docker repo. Uh, Mr. Mendez slash webgoat Docker. He might be here right now. I'm not sure. Um, and we're going to call it Docker and open up 8080. That's pretty simple. So the next file that we need is the service. So if you remember, the way we access any given pod is through a service. So we have to spin up a service for WebGoat. We want it to be accessible to the outside world or through a VPN, probably, because it's a vulnerable application and you'll get owned. But yes, either way. Um, so you're going to define a service here uh, with a WebGoat port 8080, target port 8080. Super simple. Uh, the selector, again, key value pair. You just tell it, go to this deployment, and I can scale that deployment up and down, and my service stays the same. And this is a type load balancer. So I'm going to tell GC, uh, Google Compute to go spin up um, an external IP for me to access this thing. kubectl create-f is how you do most things in Kubernetes, uh, and you give it a file. So I'm in the, web, the WebGoat directory. And I give it my service first. Doesn't matter, but I'll do the service first. Create the service. And now I'm going to look at my services uh, using kubectl. So you can see WebGoat now has this public IP. It has a cluster IP, which is known to other pods, but not the outside world. And 8080 is open. So I'm going to create the WebGoat deployment. And um, again, kubectl create-f, super simple. And we're going to look at the deployments that are currently running. So I have one pod in my deployment running WebGoat. That's it. There's one available and one running. No big deal. Uh, I'm going to get the pods. And there are ways to using kubectl to exec into these in a way, the same way you would with Docker, how, almost like SSH, but you're connecting directly to the pod if you need to do some troubleshooting. kubectl logs, it will be your friend as you're doing this. It's just, you know, you can tail the logs. You can do all the same things you could do elsewhere. Uh, now, back to the service. I'm going to look at this IP, plug it in my browser, and I have WebGoat running publicly for everybody to use. This is not running anymore. This is a test, so don't go break my machine. But um, this is pretty useful. Uh, I can spin these up now for developers any given time, any tool you want, and it's in production. But this one doesn't use a lot of leverage a lot of the, the really good parts of Kubernetes. So we'll look at that in a minute. Um, and this is how you would scale it, sorry. So you would do uh, kubectl, scale, deployment, webgoat, replicas equals six. Within seconds, you have six running pods with webgoat. So if all of a sudden I was in a room of 500 people that were trying to break webgoat at the same time, I could just spin this up and I wouldn't topple anything over, probably. Uh, I'm going to move on to ThreadFix. If anybody's familiar with ThreadFix, it's a was an open source project. I don't think it is anymore, but I still use it. Um, and ThreadFix is a vulnerability aggregation tool. It provides basically graphing, and, and you can import scan results and all these things. Uh, it's really useful uh, because it's open source, and it's actually a pretty good UI. But we wanted to make sure it was run. It, it runs with, with Java, and it's very hard to set up. And I had kind of like a rough time with it at first a, while, a few years back. So now I have it in um, Kubernetes. Uh, this is, I won't go into too much detail, but this is kind of what a, a more like advanced Kubernetes config would look like, where you have data persistence with our thread fix MySQL deployment. So we're running MySQL in a separate um, deployment, and then we have thread fix MySQL persistent volume claim. I'm going to go grab a 10 gig volume, which is awesome because now I can spin these things up and down and tear the whole thing out, and I'll still have my data. So it's not a toy anymore. Um, and then you have ThreadFix MySQL service. So that just exposes 3306 and, and all the other things. And then ThreadFix secrets. That's how our ThreadFix front end, which is Java, will talk to the back end, which is MySQL. Uh, and then the last one is the ThreadFix service itself. So 
this is where the, like, the magic comes in. I just go to this directory, and if things are running and tested the right way, I cube ctl create dash f, and then just a dot, and it just creates everything in that directory. And I literally have a running thread fix with persistent database, MySQL, 10 gig volume, scalable, all the things you would expect out of a production security tool are kind of just ready to go. And I think that's uh, pretty magical compared to dealing with Java and MySQL and XML, which is like all thread fixes. And uh, so this makes it very easy for me. And that's just the web UI. I don't think I just grabbed the screenshot somewhere. Um, so in short, uh, Kubernetes has really offered me and us at our company a way to deploy security tools at scale in a production-like environment. Um, it doesn't have to be Kubernetes. It doesn't have to be Docker even. But this is just one way I figured I'd share how uh, we were doing things. And it's become very useful uh, because I don't have to maintain any chef cookbooks. I don't have to deal with really SSHing to a server anymore. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, and you can really DevSec ops all the things. We do a lot of CI and CD and scanning and, and automation. And this is all done in Kubernetes now. So we can run Breakman in Kubernetes as a job type, which spins up pods and then breaks them back down when the job is done. Great for security scanners like Zap or um, Nessus even. Like you just use the CPU and the RAM as you see fit, and then it goes away. Uh, and I, you know, I think we're all on this container journey together, and we're all doing it a little different. So uh, I think we have a long way to go, but it can be really useful, I think, for all, all of us in security. So we can be an enabler. And here's some resources, nothing major. Kubernetes Bootcamp on GitHub is, is pretty useful, really pretty graphics and things. There's a link here. And CloudSock is just some of the stuff I'm working on. It's up on GitHub, and you can hack away at it. Um, Tell me what I did wrong. And then Minikube is uh, this your hello world. That's like, I want to learn Kubernetes. I'm going to get it running locally on my, uh, on my box and go from there. So that's all I have. Um, we're at 45 minutes or so. Hopefully your Kubernetes deployment doesn't end up like this. You might have moments where it will. It's fine. You can just rebuild your cluster. That's it. Questions? What's up? Do you have any suggestions for how to maintain sort of a gold images, your, your, your core trusted images? Uh, yeah. So that is something we do with the private repository right now. Um, and our app builds from base every time. So we don't, we're actually using, we're actually going to be using Encore shortly to write tests that will, will disallow anything that's not from that golden private repository. That's maintained by the operations team. And then dev can do kind of whatever, because we know that that has been a tested and vetted base image. And Encore, you know, I, we had an in-depth demo last week, and it's come a long way where it can, it, can write all, it can run all those tests for you and actually do active blocking in your Jenkins builds if somebody tries to throw something in an image. So that's what I would do. On Encore, A-N-C-H-O-R-E. Yeah, so their uh, container security deep uh, container inspection tool. Uh, it's open source. They have and they have a paid version, obviously too. But they, I had that screenshot up there. It didn't come up very well. But they do. They basically rebuild a, an OS out of a, a, an image that's sitting in Docker Hub or whatever, and then run security scans on it and then tell you what's wrong with it. Because you don't have visibility into that, really. When you just do a Docker pool, you don't know what's going on. So they're, uh, they're charging ahead in that space. Cool. What's up? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> yes? Um, yeah, so Nessus might not be a great example. You should probably talk to your Nessus or Tenable representative, and they can tell you what you should and shouldn't do. Uh, we're really we we used we did use OpenFAS before, which is op open source, obviously. Uh, Nessus would be interesting. I, I'm not sure what their licensing will allow or not allow you to do. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You could put a ter you could put a terabyte in there, yeah. Yeah, um, you could you could definitely copy the data over onto a bigger a bigger volume. That's probably what I would do, and then just throw it on like a hundred gig volume. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I don't think you could. I don't know if you could just add a, another one and it would know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. There some cloud providers, like I can't speak for all of them, probably will let you just elastically say, "I had ten, now I want fifty, and they'll take care of it. I think Google allows you to do that, but I'm not sure. So. Mm -hmm. In Kubernetes? I think most people start with a mix of virtual machines and instances and Kubernetes, so they both need to talk to Vault. We don't have Vault in Kubernetes. And I'm not sure we have a plan. I don't know if we'll do that, because I think we'll always have some service outside of Kubernetes that we'll need to talk to Vault. It's kind of separately managed in its own thing. But if you were starting from scratch, there's no reason why you couldn't run it in Kubernetes proper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got their own, like, weird setup at this point. It's just hybrid. Cool. All right. Well, if that's it, thanks, everyone, for coming and sticking around. I appreciate it.